How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science and Medicine Podcast Award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. Joining us now is Lori Bassett from the Greenwood Genetics Center. Lori is a board certified genetic counselor like myself, um, and since 2010 has served as the Greenwood Genetic Center's director of communications. So really a perfect person to be on this episode. Um, and I am even, for those watching the video, you see it, but for those not watching the video, I am wearing my Greenwood Diagnostic Labs t-shirt uh, shout out to Caroline who gave it to me because we are celebrating the 50 year anniversary of Greenwood Genetic Center. So for those that can't do math fast enough, that was 1974. So happy birthday anniversary to Greenwood. Lori, thank you so much for coming on to celebrate this really big milestone for GGC. Thank you, Kara. It really is very exciting here at GGC. This entire year is going to be full of celebrations of this 50th anniversary. Yeah, it definitely is. I noticed right away that new gold logo popped up. Um, for those of you listening to this in podcast player, you probably see that above Lori's head there. Um, so that's the new logo for the year and everything. Yep. So it's very exciting. But for those that maybe didn't listen to our prior episode with Greenwood, which was a couple of years ago now, um, or maybe just aren't familiar with the Greenwood Genetic Center, Lori, can you fill them in a little bit on just like a background of Greenwood and kind of how you guys have contributed to our genetics community and industry over the past 50 years. We'll dive into a lot more details, but kind of just, you know, fill people in that maybe haven't heard of Greenwood before. Yeah, absolutely. So the Greenwood Genetics, genetics Center, or what you're going to hear me call it, is GGC throughout the rest of this, this discussion. Um, we're a nonprofit organization, and we're based in Greenwood, South Carolina, which is a small southern town, not your typical location for a genetics organization like this, but we can talk a little bit more about that history and how we got here. But um, we're a very patient-centric, patient-focused organization. Uh, we have four different areas. So the primary area is clinical genetic services, taking care of patients. Um, that is what drives everything that we do. We see patients across the state of South Carolina, we have a diagnostic laboratory that provides state-of-the-art genetic diagnostic testing. We have a research division that does both basic science projects on rare diseases, as well as very patient-focused functional studies. And then we have wide-reaching educational initiatives as well. Yeah, so there is a lot going on, a lot of different divisions. I think we'll kind of break a lot of those down and just see um, really what is available because people listening are going to be interested in the different areas, I think. Um, yeah. but I would love to go back in time a little bit and talk about the motivation to start GGC. I mean, why did it end up in Greenwood, South Carolina? Because I'm kind of curious about that because as you said, it, it kind of at first seems like a random place, um, exactly. in terms of where we hear of a lot of places based in, you know, if they're based in the U S they're, you know, somewhere in California, Boston, New York, I mean, you know, a lot of sites in Texas. So this one seems a little out there. So right. Why Greenwood, South Carolina? And I'm assuming that's where the name came from. That's where the name you know, came from. That's yeah, probably a so safe the, assumption, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the challenge for your listeners is, can you locate Greenwood on a map? I'm guessing there you go. couldn't. Hopefully you can find South Carolina. but I would hope um, that part. I can't because yes. I've been there many yeah. times. Myrtle Beach yes. was definitely a place that I went to a lot growing up. Absolutely. But, absolutely. Yeah. but that's a question I get a lot when I'm talking about the Greenwood Genetics Center because folks in the genetics community have heard of us. They know the good work that we're doing, but no idea how we got to be in Greenwood. So the story is that our co-founders, Dr. Roger Stevenson, who is a pediatrician and a clinical geneticist, and Dr. Hal Taylor, a lab geneticist, met when they were genetics fellows at Johns Hopkins back in the early 70s. Um, they struck up a friendship and they really dreamed of developing a genetics program that would be completely focused on compassionate patient care and 
using state-of-the-art technologies to do that. So they didn't really plan a location at first. They just knew that it, they wanted it to be in the South, which is home for both of them. Um, so they reached out to a variety of hospitals and medical schools around the Southeast without very much success um, until Dr. Stevenson made a visit to a medical school friend who happened to be an orthopedic surgeon in Greenwood, South Carolina. So that connection led to more connections, one with a local textile businessman named Jim Self and others with some folks at the state level um, at what was then the South Carolina Department of Mental Retardation, which is now Disabilities and Special Needs. And between Mr. Self, um, he was always looking for ways to grow and support the Greenwood community. He thought this was a really innovative and interesting idea. Um, so he put up some of that starting funding to to develop this center along with the state. But Mr. Self's one stipulation with that gift was, if you're gonna use my money for this, you're gonna put it in my hometown. Mm. Um, so Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Taylor, their mentors told them, yeah, good good luck with that. Um, you know, you'll be calling us for a job within a year, but you know, this can't possibly succeed with a genetics organization in a little Southern mill town. Um, but that was 50 years ago and we're celebrating this huge milestone now and all the contributions that that GGC has made to the field. Yeah. Wow. That's quite a story. I definitely didn't know the background. I was like looking forward yeah. to learning more about it today, but yeah. that kind of makes sense of like, it was really kind of a happenstance of like who they were meeting and, and what those relationships ended up being. Right. And then it's like, okay, ended up in Greenwood. Right. Um, so I think that's really cool. And that, you know, the, the, the name is a nod to that. And then, you know, obviously you guys are still there. Um, but you know, that origin story, I think it's always interesting just to see how that happened. And, and that was, you know, as you said, like early seventies, you guys were found in 1974. So that was early days of genetics. Like that, that was very groundbreaking, especially to not be somewhere like, you know, I think like, why not Charleston? Why not Atlanta? Like there are other places where I think it would have been, uh, kind of made sense at the time. Made a little and more sense. Just, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's cool. And I think it's something that's very, very unique. Yeah, well, um, you mentioned that we have satellite offices now that are spread across the state. So those, our home campus is at Greenwood, but our satellite offices do hit those larger population centers like Greenville, Columbia, Charleston. Ah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And I hear Charleston is beautiful. I've not been there yet. Gorgeous. Um, you need to make that trip. List. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Maybe next time I'm visiting family and, you know, they live in the line of North Carolina and South Carolina. So Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful city. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from my understanding, GGC is structured in a more unique way compared to other genetic organizations. I mean, on the show, we've done over 275 episodes over 11 years. Like we've talked to a lot of people. Right. So I've, I've kind of learned a lot about just how companies are structured in, in the genetic space. I would love to learn more about the four collaborative divisions of that um, and kind of just, you know, what what falls under each of those? Because as I said, yeah. I think when it comes to those, some people more may be more interested in the clinic side or more the research side um, and probably depends on, you know, where they're coming from and like how they may collaborate with Greenwood in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So ever since we were founded, we've had these four separate divisions. But one of the interesting and I think unique things about the Greenwood Genetic Center is the way all these divisions work so tightly together and collaborate. So um, division first division is clinical genetic services. So um, we serve patients across the lifespan across the entire state of South Carolina. Like I said, we have our home campus in Greenwood, but we don't want patients in Charleston or on the coast to have to make that trip to Greenwood. So we do have these other four satellite locations across the state. And if you look at the map of South Carolina and where we're located, it's very geographically spread out. And that's by design so that patients have better access to those services. So um, we see patients with genetic counseling services with clinical genetics evaluations. Um, we do, we're involved in clinical trials through that clinical division, um, really pushing, trying to get answers for our patients and trying to find ways to improve their quality of life. So the clinic side, the patients that we see are really what drives the, the organization to move forward. So within the clinic division then, is there a certain area that you're focused on in terms of like, I mean, there's so much nowadays in terms of like, you know, there's pediatric cancer, prenatal or kind of the main areas in terms of like genetic counseling. And that's the mind frame that I'm coming from. Right. But also there's like more random areas like neuro and ophthalmology. Is there an area that's more focused on in terms of, I mean, you have the main campus, the satellite offices, but there's so much within that. So I think people are probably kind of wondering that aspect. Sure. Absolutely. So we see patients 
for any of those indications or reasons. We have the capabilities to deal with those. But our niche, our area of expertise is really more in um, neurodevelopmental disorders. About 75% of our patients are pediatric. So that is really kind of our area, of, main area of interest. But we are expanding and, and are seeing patients in our cancer clinics and seeing patients in adult clinics as well. But neurodevelopmental um, disabilities, birth defects, those are areas where we have a lot more uh, research experience and a lot more interest. And a lot of that comes out of that initial startup um, from the South Carolina Department of Disabilities and Special Needs. Those are the populations that are served by that agency, individuals with intellectual disability, with autism. Um, and so that really sort of became our first area of, of interest and in research and expertise, and it just sort of grew from there. Yeah, that, that is awesome. And just serving yeah. a population in this, you know, physical area that without Greenwood, I kind of wonder who they would go to and just you know, you're in an area where, you know, say Greenwood had ended up in Atlanta or something, then, you know, it's a little bit different yeah. in terms of like, you're, you're serving a population that without Greenwood, I just, I, I worry, like, what would that look like? For we, patients we have in that nothing area? to back this up, but we always joke and say that there are more geneticists per capita in South Carolina than, than anywhere else because of the Greenwood Genetics Center. We have a, we're a small that state, we sense. have a relatively small population, but there's a lot of geneticists here. Right. Have just in terms since, of the you know, ratio. The, the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That is so funny. Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. And then I know you guys also have like the diagnostic lab division. Is that kind of the second division? Am I getting that right? That is that is the second division. So we have biochemical lab, a cytogenetics lab, and a molecular lab that offer that state-of-the-art testing for our own patient populations, the ones we see in our clinics, um, but also from referring providers from around the country and around the world, sending samples to our laboratories. We process about twenty-five to 30,000 samples every year through our labs. Wow, that's a lot. And one thing I think about back on episode 145, I believe, let me check. Yes, episode 145, we um, had colleagues of yours on to talk about like EpiSign. And like, right. so is that like an example? That's a epigenetic test that you guys offer right. and have really um, improved over the years and, and changed and made a lot of updates on. But I would think that's within the diagnostic lab an example. It is. What you guys it are is. known so we for. Yeah, so we offer, you know, your standard biochemical, cyto, and molecular tests. We're doing whole genome sequencing. But EpiSign is one that we're really, really proud to be involved in. It's one of these novel um, tests that's able to, to make these diagnoses when some of these other technologies come short. Yeah, no, that's really interesting because yeah. there's not a lot yeah. of other labs that are offering that, at least last I checked. No, GGC is the only lab in the United States that's offering it right now. So we're really, really proud to be a partner with London Health Science Center in developing that test and bringing it to, to the clinic. Wow. That's, that's yeah. surprising, but impressive that you guys are the only ones that offer that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then you have the research aspect, right? So that's right. Like a whole nother aspect. Right. So the, the research division, they, um, they use a variety of different research methodologies, including model organisms. We have a, an aquaculture zebrafish facility here. So they do have basic research projects with an interest particularly in lysosomal storage disorders and congenital disorders of glycosylation. Those are two big areas of interest um, for some of their, their basic, basic studies. But um, a lot of what we do there, and one thing we're really proud of is the functional work that we're doing. So we can take this, you know, these VUSs that we're identifying on genomes and um, instead of just leaving it as a VUS or having to reach out for collaborations from, you know, across the, you know, across the world, we have a laboratory here where um, if it's a gene that the zebrafish have and we can make that, that functional study work, we can do those projects and get that resolution to that variant. And the zebrafish also give us a way to, um, to interrogate various treatments and therapies for some of these conditions at that, that zebrafish level. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I always love learning, like, what are the animal models that certain companies use and, right. and why, you know, I think of the mouse model is probably the most standard, right. um, but you know, zebra fists are, are up there, you know, it's certainly not the one that is the most common. Right. Um, I'm just curious, is there a reason why Greenwood shows zebra fish over other types of models like Drosophila, like the fruit flies, like th those are kind of more right. standard in my mind. Right. So we actually have a collaboration. We work closely with Clemson University. They have a, actually have a facility on our campus and they do the Drosophila work. So we do work with projects with Drosophila as well. We actually um, hired Dr. Rich Steet from the University of Georgia about five or six years ago now to head up our research division. And um, he was already a zebrafish geneticist we had worked with in the past. You know, Athens and Greenwood are not terribly far apart. So we'd collaborated with Rich in the past. Um, and when he and his wife, Heather, came here, they brought their fish 
um, they moved their fish laboratory here. And it was the first model organism that we had here on our campus. And it's proven to be very robust. Um, you know, you can you get those generation times turn around quickly. The zebra fish, um, the embryos are transparent. So you can visualize those uh, that development you know, in real time and um, have really given us some answers for some patients that we may not otherwise have found. Yeah. It's very cool. I, as a, as yeah. a kid, I used to have fish tanks and, and that was yeah. one of the ones that, you know, I looked at not knowing I'd go into genetics that that's going to be a model organism yeah. and all that. Um, yeah. but yeah, no, that is very cool. I, I didn't like think through that, right. Because the embryos are transparent. Like you can right. really see a lot that's going on, exactly. um, you know, without having to do a lot of manipulation there, right. um, to look at that. So right. yeah, that's, and with when we have guests that come visit and they hear that, you know, we share 70% of our DNA with zebrafish, that's a, that's a great conversation starter to get, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> to be able to explain how the zebrafish work and how, how we can take the zebrafish and actually get answers and not only answers, but sometimes treatments for the yeah. patients that we're taking care of. Yeah. And I, I think along with that, the, the short, um, I don't, I want to say turnaround time cause it's such a, a, a buzzword we use yeah. and, and everything, yeah. but in terms of like the, the time of reproduction is, yeah, is the generation quick. time is, thank right, you. The generation short. time, that's what I'm looking for. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That that's really helpful when it, when it comes to looking at how that's going to affect. So that, that's so interesting. Right. Yeah. I really yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Um, and when it comes to the impact, like the reason we're all in genetics, the reason that we all are active in this field and we're contributing, it comes back to, to make people's lives better, right? To educate people. Um, are there any, you know, standout like success stories or something that has really hit home for you in terms of, wow, this is something that Greenwood had this impact on a person's life or a group of patients or anything like that? Yeah, we, I mean, we love to share those kind of stories. We have so many patients that, that have found those answers and found those treatments. And um, one that comes to mind is a young lady that was referred to us uh, named, by the name of Chloe. She was referred when she was 12, but she started having concerns and issues much, much younger. She had, when she was first walking, she had um, issues with her balance. She was developing tremors in her eyes, tremors in her hands. Um, she had learning delays and seizures. And, um, you know, she had bounced from specialist to specialist without an answer. Answer. And unfortunately, it took until she was 12 for someone to say, hey, maybe you need to go see genetics. Um, so she did get referred to our office. She um, had at that time we were doing exome. So we did an exome on Chloe and found a, one of those lovely variants of uncertain significant significance in a gene called NUS1 that we really it was suspicious, but it just, you know, wasn't clear. So um, we called up our research friends across the street and said, hey, does zebrafish have NUS1? Turns out they do. So we introduced Chloe's variant into um, a line of zebrafish. And what we noticed with those fish is that their swimming patterns were very unusual. They would kind of stay around the edges of the of the tanks and the whales rather than sort of doing their random swimming. Um, they swam faster than other fish. And so that told us we've got a movement disorder in these fish. And when we look back at Chloe, with her seizures and tremors and uh, balance issues, she had a movement disorder. So it, it was enough for us to be able to classify that as pathogenic. And then we also studied those fish a little more closely and realized they were storing excess cholesterol in their lysosomes. And once we gave them a drug to remove that excess cholesterol, we started to see their swimming behaviors normalize. So we were able to use the fish to get an answer, which was our first goal, but we were then able to, to really resolve the issues in the fish. Um, wow. So we're now working towards developing a way to, to be able to work with Chloe and see, is that the same mechanism that's going on with her? And can we, can we resolve or at least improve some of those, those movement issues in her? And the um, treatment so that you guys used in the zebrafish that has Chloe's at the time said BUS, now you're saying it's pathogenic, which makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, was, is that like a previously a Approved like FDA drug for other purposes that you're like, can we use it maybe for this indication? Yeah. So all of the drugs, all the things that we're using with the fish are small molecules or drugs that are already FDA, FDA approved for other purposes. So um, it's something we're not to the point of being able to transfer it directly to, to Chloe at this point. Um, there's some other situations that we have to think about there, but um, it's certainly giving us a path to move, move forward. And it's given her family an answer. It's given her family hope that we're, we're working very hard to get to a, a treatment for her. And last I heard, Chloe is doing very well. Um, she's been free of seizures and they've been monitoring her and, and doing great. So oh, we're happy wonderful. to have been a small part of that. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it, it just shows the power of being able to use animal models to say, okay, we have this one person with this one variant that we're not, we need more information about how does this work and introducing that into an animal model and saying, okay, yeah. what symptoms do we see? I mean, I think that shows kind of just it's like personalized medicine at its finest, right? Of like, yeah. you're really taking one person, one variant and seeing how that affects. Yes. Um, I mean, that's just so powerful. And it's, it's really cool when we hear studies like this. Um, yeah. And I'm sure and Chloe's family yeah. is just very grateful. They are, they are. They've expressed that in, in numerous situations. Um, but that's one of the things that the Greenwood Genetic Center, having these divisions that are so, so cohesive and so communicative with each other, we're really able to get these projects run through and, um, you know, make some progress, maybe a little faster than we would otherwise without that great collaboration. It makes sense because a lot of the genetic testing companies are just genetic companies, I guess I should say, are specializing in areas, right? I think a lot of them offer like whole genome sequencing and, and we're kind right. of, you know, transitioning that over time where some tests are not being ordered as much because whole genome sequencing is taking over. Right. But to have a company that has these four pillars of divisions, then you start having that interdisciplinary like collaboration, as you're saying, like if you see someone in the clinic, well, maybe, oh, you're ordering a test in your diagnostic lab and then all right, that comes back negative. Is there something we can do in the research division? You know, so right. it's just such an interesting approach and, and just options with that. And as I'm saying that, I realize we've talked about three and not the fourth. So I got to <laughs> imagine that's education because we have not talked about the famous visual aids that if that, genetic counselors yeah. know of Greenwood and they're just familiar with it, that's why. The, that's the, why. the famous flip books. Yeah. That's why so, the Greenwood flip book officially the Greenwood it's the genetic, book. officially it's the genetic counseling aids. Um, but it's, it's been called the Greenwood flip book for as long as I've been in the field. Um, I was going to so say for, that, that is yeah. the, like, if you're in the field, that's what it's going to be called. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first flip book actually came out in 1984. Um, we've got a copy in our library to you know it's about oh, this fun. thick, just, just a handful of, a visual aids there. But for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a visual aids tool that's used by counselors and clinicians around the world um, to help explain these complicated genetics concepts to patients. And um, folks put them in presentations, but the main purpose is to use them in clinic with patients. Um, and so now it's about that thick. Um, oh, it's very yeah, thick, 1984 thick was the first one. And we've, we're now, I think, on our seventh edition. Of that the, of sounds the about right. Book. Yeah. 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 I've certainly used it. Um, Green was very nice and sent me a copy in it. I have to say, I had to find a very big binder for it. There's so yeah, many in bigger. there. And just like the updates that you guys have made is really interesting. Like I, you know, remember flipping, I haven't used it cause it doesn't make sense in prenatal necessarily, but like pharmacogenetics. And like, that was like, I think one of the newer ones, I don't know which edition that came out in, but one of the newer ones. And yeah, it's just great because there's so much. And, and I think one aspect that I really like is that, um, there's just more diversity throughout too, that I think in the past, you know, I'm sure like the first edition and stuff, just where we were, you know, in the field and in society, a lot of visual aids are, you know, based on people of European descent. And so right. I just love that the visual age has changed a lot over time. And, and, you know, in general, you know, we've gotten better, but that includes Greenwood there. Yes, we, we made a very concerted effort to make sure that it was more inclusive for the populations that we're seeing. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's huge. And you just have, I think yeah. one of the ones that at least in my prenatal world, um, the amnio and CVS visual aids, like that's the ones that I see people pull up the most in terms of, yeah. you know, while they're counseling, especially, I think it's great for students because, you know, sometimes as you get in your career, you may not use visual aids as much, or you might start using them more, you know, it kind of, it, your it counseling changes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. But I think students definitely use it like the most, I think percentage wise and everything. Um, but yeah, Absolutely. there's just, there's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And as we mentioned at the top of the episode, the reason that we're kind of chatting about Greenwood today is because you guys are celebrating 50 years. So we talked a lot about like the origin story and what you guys offer now. Um, but I want to focus on like the achievements and like the contributions that GGC has contributed to. Um, any that come to mind, like, you know, I know we kind of mentioned like the birth um, defects or differences prevention program. Um, are there others yeah. that you're thinking about in terms of like, you know, I'm really proud we were able to do this or we yeah. continue to offer this? Yeah. Well, one of the benefits of having one of these milestone anniversaries is you kind of get retrospective and you look yeah. back and see, you know, where, how far we've come. Um, so yeah, so the, the birth defects prevention program is a big one. It's something that's still going on. Um, you know, back when folic acid was first identified as being that 
that key to preventing neural tube defects, we were one of the very first for states to provide that prevention education to healthcare providers and women. And so it's been very successful and it's been hailed by the CDC as one of those programs to, 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 mo to mimic by other states. Um, I would say in the research area, one of the things we're best known for is X-linked intellectual disability. That's an area that Dr. Stevenson, our co-founder and our former director of research, Dr. Charles Schwartz, got very involved in and really, I think, are the gurus in this area in the field of clinical genetics. Um, <clears throat> Our labs identified about a third of the known XLID genes that exist. Um, that includes those that are responsible for um, alpha thalassemia, intellectual disability, for Wren Penning syndrome, Snyder Robinson, FG syndrome. Um, and then we were the, one of the first labs to provide molecular testing back when FMR1 was identified for Fragile X and MECP2 for Rett syndrome. Um, uh, another condition that we are really, really well known for is Phelan McDermid syndrome. That is um, on, on chromosome 22. Our former lab director, Katie Phelan, actually identified the causative finding for Phelan McDermid syndrome, and it's named after her. Um, our array lab was instrumental in getting the very first FDA cleared array, Cytoscan HD. So we were a part of that. Uh, wow. I mentioned Rett syndrome before. That's been a one of one of our favorite conditions, I think, throughout the years. Our current director, Dr. Steve Skinner, is one of the world leading experts on Rett syndrome. So we're a Rett syndrome center of excellence, and we're a clinical site for debut, which just last year was the very first FDA approved drug for Rett syndrome. So we're excited to see that transition from identifying the gene to testing for it to now being able to to have a therapy available. Um, and then we already mentioned EpiSign, which is something we're super proud to be involved in, um, to the genomic methylation signatures for our recent version came out with um, over 90 different conditions now that we can test for through EpiSign. So that's continuing to grow and be a way that we can get answers for those families that are still looking. Wow. So many like landmarks in genetics yeah. in general has come from Greenwood. I mean, I'm like, as I'm sitting here, like, learning of all this. I'm like, we got to do an episode on X-linked intellectual disability genes and all that. Like that is totally an episode we've, in itself. We've got the folks who can talk about that. Yeah. I know. I'm like, right there is the world experts. I mean, that Absolutely. is, that is just impressive. And I want to pull out, you said like identifying uh, about a third of a third known X-linked uh, genes related to intellectual disability. I mean, that's a huge chunk. Yeah, um, and and it makes sense with your history of doing like the testing for gene related to fragile X syndrome. Cause like that's an X linked, you know, related right. intellectual disability disorder. Um, so yeah, it all, it all kind of makes sense of when you have this history, you're able to have that information and that foundation to be able to bring even more into the field and like, you know, just be state of the art with research, which is just impressive because you guys do right. so much that it's not like you're just research. So, right. right. Yeah, no, that's, that's very cool. Well, I mean, a lot of this is ongoing, but Anything you haven't mentioned that um, that Greenwood is working on now or things to look forward to? I don't know how much I'm I'm able to tease out of you in terms of the future or what's <laughs> NDAs at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, with looking back with this anniversary has been really fulfilling and rewarding, but the biggest thing we want to do now is look ahead. What's what's going to come in the next 50 years at, in genetics and at GGC specifically? So um, we have a formal agreement with the Medical University of South Carolina. We talked about Charleston earlier. So we have very close partners there in Charleston that we're working on improving genetic services for patients and families in our state. Um, the, the big strategic plan now here at GGC is a precision, precision medicine initiative um, that, that combines our culture of, of compassionate patient care with making sure we have these innovative technologies available. So we have this project we're calling the four A's. There's access, analysis, answers, and action. Uh, so access is how do we make these services more accessible and remove the barriers that are keeping patients from getting to genetics clinic. You know, if you have the greatest technologies and tests and therapies, but the patients can't get into your door, it's, it's not worth much. Um, the second A analysis is evaluating novel technologies like RNA-seq, long read sequencing, optical genome mapping to see which of those technologies are most useful um, and for which cohorts of patients. Um, the third is answers. So that is our genomic discovery program, which is um, using these technologies, the ones we already have and these novel ones, to get to those answers, to make the diagnoses that have been eluding us, to clarify these variants that we're finding. 
And then the last A, action, is the goal of all of this, is to um, go beyond the diagnosis to improve the quality of life for these patients and their families, um, to deliver these novel therapies, identify new treatment targets. So that's really, we're, we're putting all of our forces and resources behind these four A's, um, again, all for the good of our patients. Um, and then one other initiative that's really kind of new to us is I talked earlier about we're kind of into the you know, pediatric area and looking at developmental conditions, but we started a new initiative called the Carol Campbell Alzheimer's Initiative. Carol Campbell was a former governor of South Carolina who passed away um, after battling Alzheimer's. But this is a collaboration between GGC, the Veterans Administration, and a biotechnology company called Mitosense to investigate the use of mitochondrial organelle transplantation to help repair or replace defective mitochondria that might be in the cells that are causing uh, some of the features of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a brand new initiative that we're really excited about that's getting off the ground. And again, looking towards that action point, is, is this something that could be a potential therapy, not just for Alzheimer's, but for other patients who have disorders of mitochondrial dysfunction? So yeah, lots of, lots of exciting stuff going on. Yeah, just a few things, future. right? Just, just a couple of things <laughs> that are on our list. Yeah, that is, that is so exciting. And I didn't even, I didn't even uh, think when we were talking about personalized medicine, precision medicine earlier that yeah. you had this whole initiative. So, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. That kind of, we uh, showed a good example of how that can work earlier in the episode talking about right. Cardi's story. And right. um, yeah, there's just been a lot of advancements, I think in the last couple of years with Alzheimer's. So that makes sense of kind of joining that space and, and seeing what can happen there. And I mean, mitochondria is just so interesting. We've done a couple Very. episodes. I'll put them in the show notes for people about mitochondrial disorders, including an episode with a genetic counselor that also has a mitochondrial disorder. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Very um, interesting. So yeah, again, I'll link that in the show notes. Um, but for those that want to learn more about Greenwood genetics, especially epigenetic testing, I recommend, I mentioned it earlier in the episode, but to go back to episode 145, because we definitely dive deep into EpiSign, but knowing now, since that's been produced, if I'm remembering right now, we have over 90 conditions. Greenwood is 90 testing conditions. for it. I get it right? Nice. Just 90 <laughs> conditions. Version five came out, I think about two weeks ago. Okay. So early 2024, definitely. Brand new, hot so, off the presses. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. So for those that want to learn more about the epigenetics there and, and what we can test for. Um, and I want to mention, I sadly will not make it to ACMG this year. I think oh. it's in Toronto and I was really looking forward to it, but it's not going to happen, but you guys are going to be there. So Absolutely. for everybody listening, um, if you're listening to this, like right when it comes out, um, ACMG is in just a couple weeks. So go say hi, learn more at their booth. That's booth 1201. Um, so 1,201. Look for and the gold logo. Yeah, look for the gold logo. And I'm sure a lot of green because that's kind of, you know, your main color. So, um, but yeah, you guys had a really good booth at NSGC at the last one a few months ago. So I'm assuming it's going to be just as fun this year. But yeah, thank you so much, Lori, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Um, it's just so interesting to look at how much Greenwood has had an impact in genetics and just all of these different divisions as we've talked about. Um, are really just continuing to have an impact and just growing in the genetics field. So it was fun to nerd out with you for a while and, <laughs> and just learn about kind of the history too and where we're yeah. going. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me, Kara. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. We're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.